We're going to be welcoming back uh, Bruce and Amanda, who you heard from earlier. We're also going to be welcoming Andrew Martin, CEO and founder of Control Plane, and Mark Inskip, who's program director of the Morello program at ARM. Folks, if you give them a round of applause and if you'd like to make your way to the stage. Uh, good stuff. Fabulous. Guilty. I must have eaten all the other speakers' time. I think it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's all fine. Yeah. All going very well to schedule, as things generally do in my in my chairing. Um, good stuff. So you've all got microphones. That's fine. Um, fantastic. Um, firstly, I mean, we, we've we've not heard. I'm aware from from Mark uh, and Andrew. Uh, Mark, um, firstly, the Morello program at Arm. It was mentioned uh, in Paul's uh, talk. Do you want to just talk us through what that is? Just give us the overview, just in case. Yeah, yeah. I'll just give you, you a brief summary. You, you heard a little bit in in Paul's presentation. So, uh, so, so Cambridge University uh, and our, uh, SRI have been working on Cherry for, for for over a decade. Arm have been collaborating since 2014. Uh, but but it's always been very much a let's say a research activity without uh, any sort of hardware platform to, to experiment with. And Arm doesn't make hardware, so Arm actually sells on licenses. Uh, designs normally. What, so we, we've taken a step with Morello, where help, helped by government uh, government funding, um, so or from uh, Innovate UK, we, we've actually taken that. Uh, we, we've created a Morello architecture, which which takes a, a, an existing ARM architecture and extends it with the, uh, the the Cherry protection model, and we've created a a very uh, Powerful sort of platform. So, so what you, you see with the Morello board there, um, it, it it has uh, it has a, a, a seven nanometer SOC that's got four very powerful uh, super scalar um, uh, CPUs. Would take a very big basement to, to build this sort of uh, processor. Uh, so, so yeah, several hundred person years of engineering effort in, in all to create a a, a really. Uh, powerful platform that people can use to, to experiment with, with the architecture. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing at the same time is uh, we're, we're and, and our colleagues at Cambridge University are providing, uh, let's say, soft, um, the software basics to get going. And so from, uh, from Cambridge University, you get Cherry BSD, which is based on free, free BSD. Uh, on the ARM side, we, uh, we have a, we're working on the uh, couple of tool chains, so we already have a, a, a LLVM Clang tool chain. We're in the process of having a GCC GNU sort of tool chain that will be available later this year. Uh, and so that will en en enable both. Um, already we, 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 also, we have uh, a, a sort of Android based on the Android Open Source project release available. Uh, we'll develop that. And, and then as, as the GNU tool chain becomes available, we, it, it helps. Sure. In terms of Linux developers going, so so we're creating a platform that people can use to build on, and, and very much from a software side, it's a, it's an open source sort of play, and, and getting people to sure. collaborate and experiment, to, to because the, the 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 Cherry model probably isn't perfect. There were probably some the, there were there were things that we need to iron out there, but also I think you know we we are fixing that forty year old problem, mm. but I think. Also, the, 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 the Cherry model pro provides lots of opportunities, particularly around compartmentalization, to, to really build on the, the security story. And that's sure. what we were looking for people to do, because I think yeah. some of that is going to drive the pull to, to make this, this sort of step, uh, you know, let's say, commercially more interesting than, than, than all of those performance and feature enhancements that, that the consumers and, and, and industry normally wants Good. to see. Thanks, that Mark. Good, uh, good overview. Andrew, um, Amanda's already bigged up Control Plane. Do, do you want to just add, add to that? Uh, best in the world, I think, was the, uh, was the, was the phrase? It's a uh, high what, accolade indeed. What yeah. does the company, just give us the overview, just for those who don't know. We are a cloud native security consultancy. So the idea here is that we've had cloud infrastructure. We have took virtual machines and things that are architected for essentially single VM hosts and lifted, shifted into the cloud. And with the advent of containerization and Kubernetes and all these hackneyed phrases and, and wording, we've redeveloped the mechanism that we run applications in the cloud. So we build these guarantees that we get of elasticity and high availability from the underlying infrastructure. We can now orchestrate and architect applications to take advantage of that. The idea being is that everything in the cloud is ephemeral, essentially will rotate underneath you, to put it gently. And in that case, 
the entire system can fail over onto different places. Cloud native, therefore, is a certain type of software. What we saw with the advent of Kubernetes and Docker and containerization was this huge influx of development. Everything done in open source. In fact, Google sponsoring initially the Kubernetes project. And it became the most popular open source project on GitHub, um, the most popular just behind Linux, actually, the core Linux kernel. So highly and heavily invested in open source technology, it's thundered in this advent of the opportunity for small organizations to build highly complex orchestration systems at obviously a uh, human cost in terms of maintenance, but the levels that we're able to, uh, the levels that we're able to orchestrate for are far superior. Because I saw it, is there a mic? It says dead battery on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mine's almost dead as well. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. Tell them about the book. Is it? This, uh, yeah, let's try that. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's better. Uh, I've recently authored uh, a couple of vaguely interesting things. One is called Hacking Kubernetes, which is uh, a step-by-step -step guide to breaking the thing apart. It's published on O'Reilly. Uh, you can download the first half for free at controlplane.io. And, uh, and secondarily, I wrote a course for SANS uh, called Attacking and Defending Containers and Cloud Native. So we're very focused on red teaming, which is the, the, uh, the, act of, or the art of vulnerability uh, assessment and uh, exploitation, and then blue teaming, which is preventative and detective controls to prevent, uh, detect the inevitable breakages that occur in these uh, highly complex and fast moving systems. The ultimate trade off here is would you prefer to have a static piece of software, as we saw with, uh, with, with a sort of guaranteed Wi Fi um, firmware, a static piece of software that is safe at a point in time, offers you a set of functionality, but then hmm. is guaranteed at some point to sort of lag behind, um, or the rapid pace of innovation and development in open source, which by virtue of being close to the, the heads or the latest commits, will have unknown vulnerabilities in. But we get into the many eyes principle, I'm sure we'll talk about this. There is the compromise. Do, do we want to be in stasis with a piece of software with known properties that will uh, atrophy, essentially? Or do we want to be <clears throat> not to coin a phrase, but agile, responsive, moving quickly, and taking advantage of the latest features, contributing our fixes back. This is the panacea in my, in my dreams. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Good stuff. Um, by the way, we're going to be getting your questions uh, in a sec. We're also going to be changing our mics. So should we test that one, Amanda, just to make sure that works? Give us a Hello. Two. There we go. That seems better. Um, folks, if you're watching as well, you can tweet your questions. The hashtag is DSDB, Digital Security by Design at London. Uh, please do get involved on Twitter. There are people standing by to get your questions, and we'll get some from in the room first. But I'm going to hog the limelight for a little bit, just to first. Amanda, can I put this one to you first of all, and then I'll welcome the other panelists' views. Should there be a legal imperative for manufacturers to make code publicly available for systems critical to life. And we're thinking about Bruce's uh, example of the pacemaker and so on. It's really interesting. So Karen Sandler is a very close friend of mine. And we did one event with Open UK before the pandemic that was live. And Karen spoke at that about being a cyborg. And I know she would say, yes, we should ensure that all code is open source. I'm probably slightly less hardline on that in that there may be specific reasons in specific instances when open source doesn't have to be the case, when certain codes shouldn't be open source, but that should be the exception. So I think we should work on a, not so much code disclosure, because I don't agree with that. We should work on an open source first basis and then look at the proprietary code disclosure or full proprietary uh, as and when you need it. Bruce, can I come to you on this? I'm quite interested in this idea of, of, of disclosure and auditing code and so on. It strikes me there's a speed problem that, that, that if you put the code out there for everybody to look at, for my, for my knowledge of the bad guys, they're going to get to it potentially a lot quicker than the good guys are. Is, how do, you, do you see that as a problem and how do you resolve it in that case? So I would say it gives you all of the dis disadvantages and none of the advantages. Uh, we call it Linus's law. Linus Tavares came up with it. Many eyes make bugs shallow. If you share code, you make, uh, to me, you're making it potentially more vulnerable, but without adding the open source benefit, which is that that many eyes make bugs shallow. When there is a, a security uh, vulnerability, what you see is a collective collaborative response. 
who knows what goes on in proprietary code, right? They don't have to disclose this. So it's not just that they don't have to disclose the code, they don't have to disclose when there's vulnerabilities, they don't have to disclose the responses. So I also think it's a bigger picture from a policy perspective. But remember, the key to open source is that it's distributed freely and that we don't uh, have any warranty. So I think, Bruce will correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's an open source license that doesn't have a disclaimer of all liability. And what that does is take us to a point that Bruce referred to as audit. I would refer it to as curation. I didn't quite have time to talk about it. But when you're taking code, you want to make sure it's been properly curated in that it has all of that governance and hygiene. It's coming from a safe space that you know. And potentially, we even need to build stewards to be those curation points for the public sector. This, this is actually one of the implied requirements. It's not anything about the open source definition, but you would be stupid not to disclaim guarantees. So yes, every license does it. Hmm. And uh, I consult for companies that use open source and they want my help about compliance. I'm not a lawyer. I cost half of what they do. And um, I hear from these companies, one of my customers right now, the second word of their name is security. And they will not release their product. They will not make another revision until April. And they know that there are existing security bugs in that product net right now, but they're proprietary. Mm. And they sort of rely on people knowing about them. And of course, I can read Assembler and I can tell that they're there and I'm not the only one. It's, it's only the good guys who don't know about them. Um, so, you know, as I said, with the uh, 737, black boxes kill people. You know, black boxes cause you to lose money. Black boxes cause you to lose your job. And we need some way of fixing that. One of the really interesting things in what Bruce has just said is how we see sectorial shift to open source. If you follow what the Linux Foundation is doing in terms of projects, it's a good monitor, a good measure. You can see where the money's going, right? You can see who's willing to put skin in the game and pay for it. You can also see Open Invention Network and who's signing up to give their patents away to open source. And you see sectors like telco moving towards it, despite what I said about standards. You see automotive has massively moved towards it. Uh, Bruce talked about Volkswagen. The money from that Volkswagen fine was used to build, I think it's $53 million. It was an insane amount of money. And it was used to build charge points across the US. So you're never more than 15 minutes from an EV charging station in terms of drive. And what uh, that ended up with was litigation about open source because the company who won was an open source company and there was a sort of patent litigation around it. But you see all of these reactions that are inevitable to shift and to your profitability and your revenue streams being undermined. Totally expected. It's a three to five year cycle generally. So if you go and look through the history of these industries and sectors moving to open source, you see that pain. So I guess probably we're going to see aeronautical going there too. Good stuff. I just want to um, uh, I just want to bring in Mark in a second. I mean, obviously, you've talked about what Arm's done. Do you see trends? People like Apple, Google, and so uh, Apple and uh, and others moving in this, in this particular direction. Microsoft and so. On. Um, I, I think it's, it's difficult for me to comment on that. But, but actually, what I have seen is is a massive change in Arm. So I so I've, I've been with Arm for twelve years. When I first joined, we we. Within a, actually a couple of months from me joining, we were forming a small software group, bringing that software activities together. But it was it was tiny, and if I look, the 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 engineering area that's grown most in ARM over re, over the last decade or so has been the, the the open source software activity. So we've got hundreds of engineers working there now, whereas when I joined, it was maybe you know, a dozen, a couple of dozen. So and, and I think that reflects the the way in which the, the ARM ecosystems are developed and, mm -hmm. and how important uh, to, to, to people who are, who are, who are building uh, you know, software on, on top of ARM cores, just how important open source has come and I think really dominates that sector apart from a few proprietary players in that area. Um, Andrew, can I come to you? Sorry, Bruce, did you have a point? You, you didn't actually make this new security feature work with anyone's commercial compiler, did you? So, well... What we did do, so and this uh, is that the there is a uh, the the i the 
we have a set of what's called capability essential IP. So the, the essential IP that, that you need to, to, uh, to add this feature to any, any architecture. So that is, that is openly available. So, so you could add it to a RISC-V, you could add it to x86, you could add it to any, any architecture. So, and, and in a sense, um, obviously, ARM wants to be the biggest player with, it, with this new architecture, but we're, 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 we'd be happy for other people to follow that course as well. Can I ask Andrew, I mean, you're obviously working in the sort of software area. We've obviously talked about hardware as well. Where do you see the balance sitting between those? Is there any point doing the software stuff if there's still problems in the hardware? Can you comment on that at all? Yeah, I mean, there's, um, there's obviously a handoff between hardware and software. In a firmware layer, the kernel itself <coughs> is integrating uh, at a low level with CPU. From that perspective, um, I, I mean, one of my favorite horror cases, of course, is IoT, where if the source code for many IoT devices was open source, we would be able to see admin admin as hard-coded credentials. We would be able to see everything running as root, even on a Linux system um, that's got clearly defined cap uh, user base capabilities and uh, discretionary access control, which is standard. These features have been available to us for 30 years. But a lack of scrutiny in the space, a uh, sort of race to the bottom, means that those are undisclosed and then discovered by security researchers. <laughs> Um, I guess we've also got this question of whether things actually are presented as proprietary, uh, open source, or, or open source entirely. Windows gave the full, uh, to Microsoft rather, gave the full operating source code to Russia for many years as table stakes to enter the market. Mm -hmm. So even for proprietary software, this concept of open source being more or less secure, obviously Microsoft believed that it was sufficiently secure to disseminate to, um, at, at that point, a sort of foreign nation state adversary, but are unwilling from a sort of hypothetical business perspective to, to sort of trust the license and give people the ability to, uh, to run their own copies. And then we see this huge proliferation of uh, sort of cracked software, etc., which then is enabled to be upgraded and materially affects the sanctity and safety of the user data and the PII that sits on those machines. And as such, we see uh, all, all these viruses, etc., targeting mm. Windows as the primary code, primary, uh, primary target. Well, we've got some questions. Of it. Um, Amanda, can I, come can to I you just add to that from a commercial perspective and go back to what you asked about Google and others? So we've seen in the last, I think, three months, if I'm right, if my memory serves me well, Google releasing a curated open source, which is what they use internally and available for others, I, I believe, at cost, along the Red Hat subscription model, I think. We're going to see a lot more of that. Um, we're going to see a lot more players coming to market with curated open source. There's a company called Tidelift, a startup that's been doing it with multiple packages for a long time. I think we're going to see in the public sector, public-private initiatives to so, create so just that. just for my benefit, curated open source. Curated, like, yeah. So, what, what does that mean? So what it is is uh, almost like an enterprise edition of open source. And an enterprise edition is right. a version of open source software that's otherwise freely available that you will pay for. And you will pay a support or a subscription kind of functionality cost for it. And that the support and subscription will come with, if it supports support, but also it's likely to come with some level of legal indemnity. So you have some sort of assurance program going on and you will be uh, provided with updates. You will know that the, the maintenance is done properly, the security is done properly. And we'll see that coming out of enterprises more and more. I mean, Red Hat was the biggest tech transaction in history. I won't remember the number, but it's something like 38 billion in its sale to IBM. That wasn't for no reason. That's because this model works. And we're going to see it at scale across the providers. But we're also going to see it starting in public-private. And I hope the UK is going to be among the first on this to make sure that our national infrastructure is curated open source that has a, an appropriate steward managing it. Really interesting. So we're, we're from the kind of freemium model that some social networks use, kind of where you some pay a subscription to it. Yeah. There's a whole debate about open core and premium freemium and why they're different. And okay. open core is kind of what ARM are talking about, where they're distributing open source freely, holding something back that they can generate revenue from. And I suspect over time we'll share open source as new things come to market. Interesting. We've got a question here. Uh, uh, so we get a microphone down. If you're watching, hashtag DSDB London. And if questions in the room, we'll, we'll come to you. But uh, say your question. Thank you very much, uh, Alex Land and Dynamic Devices. I, it's very hard to know where to begin because the, all the talks have been so absolutely interesting. Um, I remember you know, we work with open source, have done since your colleague Eric's uh, Cathedral and the Bazaar. My boss told me it was just a fad. Maybe that was FUD, as, as you said. Um, 
But to, you know, I, unfortunately for my sins, I'm in the IoT space. I've made embedded systems for about 20, 25 years, and we have done some bad stuff. You know, so I, I'm ashamed of the things we've done. Um, and it's wonderful that we're starting to improve that. We're looking at TPMs, we're looking at T's, this uh, Morello, Cherry. Um, but, but I have a niggle in my mind, and I'd like to ask you while you're here, the workflows I see in my daily life are that we have teams of engineers, I'm an engineer, I try to create things, I build. That's my mindset. My mindset is not to break into things, to find the weakest link in the chain. Um, and typically, a company I, I would be involved with would spend six months or a year making these products. Then they would go to um, some penetration testing house, pay a bundle of money for a huge, big, thick booklet, which is essentially going to tell them that this thing is not fit for purpose in terms of security. There's a big one fight. Everybody gets very upset. So is this have to unroll everything. How can we fix that psychology? Uh, is, are these different things, or can we train engineers to do security, or do we need different roles in the business? Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Do you want to take that first? Go on. This is, yeah, this is uh, the nature of DevSecOps, we might say. Um, I think the, the sort of canonical answer is to deploy a security champion because developers have no fundamental interest. They don't have this nefarious break it, then fix it mindset. Um, penetration testers, by definition, are, again, these kind of um, uh, more inquisitive individuals, uh, and they satisfy their intellectual curiosity in a different way. I think the fix is really to move things earlier in the development cycle from an application security perspective. Um, with IoT specifically, uh, Canonical actually launched something a few years ago that escapes my name, but it uses a container. It uses snaps on the device. And Juju. sorry? Is it Juju? No, Juju's the Kubernetes offering, I think. But the, um, there is a thing, and it'll come to me eventually. Uh, th this has essentially over-the-air updates to pull in not only operating system updates, but it runs an isolated sandbox around the, the, the actual code itself because the assumption is that everything is fundamentally, not fundamentally broken, but everything is broken fundamentally in some way or another. And uh, as applications move from development through into maintenance, there is less scrutiny and observation. So from my perspective, uh, I, I would say ensuring that there is at least some sort of hardened runtime or sandbox on the device um, and trying to fix the application development process is a question of DevSecOps is placing a security conscious individual as a champion within the development team, giving them the opportunity to add cards to the backlog and sign off security requirements. And the cultural change that has to go to empower that person is then the difficult part. Nobody's talked about Shell4j, and I expect that that would be the thing that everybody talked about all the way through this, which is why I didn't mention it. I did have it on a slide, but I just sort of, I don't know if you noticed, I just smoothed it over. Gracefully. Yeah, I thought so. Um, the, the thing there is that, that the problem existed, the vulnerability existed, and we saw an open and collaborative response to it. And I'm told, and I'm sure all of you can give a better answer than me on this, but I'm told that the problem is that it underlines a lot of closed code now. So it's also sitting, it's been taken and used in proprietary environments and they don't even know what's in there. Mm. Whereas with things like the software bill of materials and the supply chain management that we have to do now in open source, and if you've ever worked in a company where you've distributed open source commercially, you had to do this 15, 20 years ago, you gotta disclose what's in there and you're liable if you don't tell the truth. You're liable if you don't provide all the details. And that's something that we don't have in the same way in the proprietary space. So I actually think it's going to be a huge advantage in open source where you can have that transparency and wash your dirty washing in public. But this thing, just to come back to you, Amanda, I mean, on this, I find this fascinating because, you know, knowing coders as I do, they don't reinvent the wheel. You know, if there's something on GitHub that they can borrow and steal, they will do it. And, and there's this really frightening picture of folks doing the coding, sitting there, who are... Who are beyond the ken of the people who actually run the company, grabbing stuff, sticking it in, making it work. And that is the reality. That is the reality, isn't it? I trained about a decade ago one of the top four consultancies. And I stood up and I said, how much open source do you use? And as these things always are, the lawyers were on the left, the coders were on the right, the developers were on the right, and the lawyers went, we don't use any. It's against company policy. <laughs> and I smiled and the developer said, we use tons of it, we use it all day, every day. And that's what I was trying to say about not relying on contracts anymore, because you can just grab it, you can just use it, and you're going to. You know, anybody who's coded or learned to code in the last 30 years is doing this. So what you've then got is how do I manage this? And the way you manage it is policies, procedures, governance. If you overload it too much, they'll ignore you. 
And there are free tools like OpenChain and SBDX, which are ISO and BSI approved standards that are there for the taking. They're just waiting for people to adopt them. And I'm going to do a plug. Our policy, not our policy, our, our um, State of Open 2022 is launched next Thursday. And I was late with my slides because I was working on it this morning. And what we are looking at is the maturity model. And we're looking at the journey. And we're looking at consumers. We're looking at contributors. And we're looking at distributors of products and services and open source. And how much of this governance stuff are each of them doing? I don't yet know where we're going to be exposed. But I suspect that we're going to have some very honest conversations that we're not doing enough in certain of these areas in the UK. Thanks, Amanda. Good stuff. Just aware. Um, we've got another question here. Oh, I'm just going to take this one because this chat's been waiting. I'll come back to it. Sorry, Hello, Thomas Moore. I'm an independent software product consultant. I have a question about the inevitable rogue actors who get creative making applications with open source things. It, it happens all the time. For hardware open source innovations, are there teams thinking about potential rogue uses of open source hardware? And uh, for example, does ARM have a team or do other organizations have teams of people thinking of what bad things could be done with hardware open source innovations uh, before they think about open sourcing them? Uh, one, for, one for Mark, the representative from, for, from ARM, first well, of all. I, I'm probably the last person to, to answer this because <laughs> ARM isn't open sourcing. Well, it, it, mm. you know, it, it does on hardware. So I think that's, that's a, a question for people in other, other parts of the industry. Really. Fair enough. Anybody else want to chime in on that, uh, rogue actors using, using open source hardware? I think um, the, the difficulty is when the rogue actor perhaps contributes back into the main line. <laughs> and uh, I, I think from an open source software perspective, that's far easier to do. From an open source hardware perspective, it's more about taking the fork and, and operating on that in isolation. If there is a, and I mean, but perhaps this is more of a question um, than a statement from me at this point. But if there is then some useful functionality that's designed as a circuit, getting that back into the main line, I think, is, is a far more stringent process than it is with software because of the, the rapidity that's possible in software. But I mean, I'm, I'm speculating slightly. I, I can add a little bit to that in that um, I'm not a developer. I can't code. Sorry. But if you look at last week's OpenSSF Day, which is available from the Linux Foundation, this was discussed at length. And they talked about the university Jim Zemlin went to that did the hack. Who was it? They put uh, malicious code into the software side. It begins with M. Is it Missouri? I think it was University of Missouri. Okay. Yeah. So they look into that and they talk about how this happened and how it's controlled. And the way that the controls come from is your good governance, your good hygiene, and looking at commits. The Nicholas Challen, who is from the Air Force, is going to talk. He and I were talking about this on the phone and how they've gone so much further. And they're really deep diving into where contributions come from. They're diving into beneficial ownership, who the contributors are, what their real names are, how these commits are happening, where you can see bad actors and repetitive patterns. Now, some of that, to me, as an open source person, makes me uncomfortable. And there's going to be a lot of discussion about how this fits with our communities and where we've come from and all that we've given out of, you know, love for what we're doing and where that ends up. But it may be something that the curation layer fixes to some extent. So th this is going to be a really interesting time, but it's also going to be a time where we're seeing these issues dealt with. And just to expand on that slightly, apologies. Go on. Okay, thank you. The, um, it's either Minnesota or Missouri. It, it escapes me entirely, yeah. But um, what, what was happening there was a group of researchers decided to attempt to push malicious patches into the Linux kernel. Now, the level of rigor uh, applied by the core team is such that none of the patches actually made it. One of them, they made a mistake that meant the malicious patch was actually um, a positive fix. So what they thought they were doing, and that got through, but everything else failed. Um, there was then, when they tried to publish their research, quite an extreme backlash at the, I guess, tens or hundreds of person hours used to do that. And some of the things Amanda's uh, alluding to there with the Open Source, uh, the, the open source Security Foundation um, include things like a developer identity working group. And we have this question of, of anonymity. The internet originally was not a know your customer based um, entity. And we've kind of transcended that as we've seen more walled gardens, as we've seen sort of multi-billion dollar corporations lay out their stall and lock their things in, um, and then require an identity. Now, the difficulty comes with collusion from developers in open source projects. When we're talking about malicious actors, internal threats. Protestware. And protestware as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, unfortunately, with, with the protestware, that person had commit access. So, so they were able to, um, and, and here we get into all sorts of questions of uh, coercion, et cetera. 
the developer identity working group essentially um, kind of self-immolated and uh, the, the ultimate problem is that if one is in a repressive or some sort of threatening situation by virtue of their political geography, then you can't decloak them, you, you can't unmask them. Um, and so we get into this question of, do we want to encourage broad open source contributions? Mm. Uh, do we want to penalize people because of their nation states behaviors? These are uh, currently intractable questions. Yeah, um, sorry, uh, and and the, the ca they're counterintuitive to the open source definition. So there will be a lot of pushback as those things yeah. go through. Bruce, over to you. So from the start of open source, really, we have worked very hard on chain of custody in the most serious projects. And the goal is always to understand if someone actually inserted a problem, who it was, and you know, maybe we could send them to jail. Now, my recent work has been on making multinational collaborations in space research work. And that was getting around a tremendous amount of uh, export law called ITAR and ear in the United States. And, and the question inevitably becomes, can some contributor get something into your space system that is in some way hostile. Now, if you look, this is scary, but if you look at the way that the United States manages nuclear missiles, there is a very important concept called no alone zone, which means that you cannot go near the missile alone. You cannot enable the missile launch without someone who is standing outside of your arm's reach, turning a key. And this is what we need for the most critical software. There must be peer review for every line written. And obviously, this comes out of Agile. And, and so many people are used to doing every bit of writing that they do with peer review. Uh, but it is absolutely a must and, you know, with the most critical code, not just two people and not at the same time. And you go back to the fact that lawyers are to blame, which again, I can say because <laughs> I did it for 25 years. In the 60s, 70s, we saw code start to develop, engineers starting to work on software development, and they did it collaboratively. That is the natural state of software. Then lawyers applied and governments applied copyright law. And if they hadn't done that, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And in my mind, we're sort of coming full circle to this inevitability of open source because that is the natural way to collaborate and to create code and to answer problems like the one Bruce has just addressed, where you have peer review and you have a lot more peer review than you sometimes want. And sometimes you're told you're stupid or you used to be before codes of conduct. But, you know, this is how our world operates. There is a level of excellence that's enforced. And I, as a lawyer joining an open source company where many of the engineers were from Debian, many of the developers were from Debian, I learned more from them and they knew more about the legal implications of software than virtually any lawyer I've ever met. There are a few, they're all in my book, but beyond that, those engineers understand it so well and they're really anal and they're really <laughs> strict and they, they make all these processes and then they make you comply with them and I'm not good at that, good but stuff. engineers are. Corrupted by law. <laughs> <laughs> Briss, I believe you. Good yeah. stuff. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to ask our panelists in a second to retake their seats in the audience, and you can leave your mics on the chairs. But uh, before they do so, please show your appreciation for Bruce Perwins, Amanda Brock, Andy Martin, and Mark Inskip. Inskip. There we go.